Continuing on our study of, of the body systems, we're now going to talk about the systems of nutrient absorption. The first system in the systems of nutrient absorption is the digestive system. The digestive system is involved with both the ingestion of and digestion of food and the absorption of nutrients and elimination of waste. So there's a lot of goes on in the digestive system. There are specialized compartments which, in which digestion occurs. In lower animals we have the gastrovascular cavity that takes care of the uh, digestion and absorption of materials for the cells. Other animals have an alimentary ca canal. This is a digestive tract with two openings, like a complete digestive system. There are specialized compartments in some animals. The pharynx, the esophagus, the crop, the gizzard, and the stomach. You can look up these definitions. They're all in your book. So we're going to talk about the, what happens in nutrient absorption and a digestion. There are chemical and mechanical methods of digestion. The mechanical digestion breaks up the food into smaller parts. The important thing about this is that it increases the surface area on which the chemicals can act. And then there are chemicals that break up the molecules by hydrolysis using enzymes and acids. We talked about hydrolysis back when we talked about um, how you put together and took apart the organic molecules like proteins and carbohydrates and nucleic acids. Um, and all of these things happen by means of enzymes and various kinds of acids and various kinds of other chemicals that are produced by the body. The food moves through the system by muscular contractions, so there is involvement of the muscular system as well here. The muscular contractions are called peristalsis or peristaltic action. And then the length of the alimentary can varies depending on what the diet of the animal is. Herbivores have longer canals than carnivores because there's more processing that has to be done to break down the plant material than the animal material that carnivores take in. Here we have a comparison of a carnivore's digestive tract and that of a herbivore. The carnivore has the stomach, the small intestine is fairly long, and it has a relatively short colon and a very small cecum. Herbivores, on the other hand, have much longer systems. They have a stomach, small intestine, a quite a long cecum for processing, and then even a longer um, um, large intestine because you've got a more... Uh, Absorption has to be done, more digestive processes have to go on to break down the plant material into smaller, more usable molecules, and then it takes longer to absorb the moisture in the, in the colon as well as the other nutrients that are absorbed in the colon. The absorption occurs in the intestine, and the, the inner walls of the intestine are thin, and there are blood vessels close by. The liver is also involved with the digestive system. It processes nutrients from digestion, removing excess glucose, which it stores as glycogen, like we talked about in the last section, uh, synthesizing essential proteins that are needed by various, uh, various organ systems in the body, modifying toxins into less harmful substances, or detoxifying those things. And it also produces bile, which helps assist in fat digestion. Part of the problem with fat digestion is that fat is not water soluble. And so the bile helps break down and emulsify the fat into smaller particles that can more easily be treated by and react to the enzymes and chemicals that are present there for digestion to, to occur. Here we see some of the structures of the small intestine. This is the small intestine here with the muscle layers and the, and the, um, the epithelial layers here. There are these large circular folds called ruggy inside the, um, the intestine, which increases the surface area. And then those ruggy are covered, are, are covered by a series of smaller um, divisions called villi, and each villus um, is composed of cells that have microvilli. So you increase the surface area by the ruggy, by the villi, and the microvilli so that you've got lots of surface area for absorption to occur. Okay, we have in the, in the lumen of the intestine, in the lining of the intestine, we have epithelial cells, we have blood capillaries, we have lymph vessels, and all of those are involved with absorbing the various compounds. The amino acids and sugars are absorbed in the blood system, the fatty acids and glycerol are absorbed in the lymph system, and uh, 
they're carried to where they need to go in the body as far as where, where the nutrients are needed. Now another system of nutrient absorption is the respiratory system because nutrients also include gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. The respiratory system allows for gas exchange. One important thing you need to know about gas exchange is that it occurs most efficiently through thin, moist membranes. And so respiratory systems in general, whatever method the animal uses for respiration, is going to involve thin, moist membranes. You need oxygen in your cells for cellular respiration, and of course carbon dioxide is a waste product from that respiration, so you need to get rid of it. There are a lot of different gas exchange mechanisms in different kinds of animals. Some of them depend on diffusion and, and osmosis from their skin. Others um, have tracheal tubes or gills or even lungs. The vertebrate organs of respiration are intimately associated with blood vessels to transport the blood through the rest of the body. Uh, in lower animals where they have open circulatory systems, of course, the um, cells of that tissue come in direct contact with the blood to absorb the oxygen and release the carbon dioxide. Here we have uh, the structures that are found inside the human and other vertebrate lungs. Okay? We have the uh, blood vessels, the oxygen-rich blood that's carried back to the heart from the lungs, and the oxygen-poor blood that is carried from the, lung, from the heart to the lungs. We have alveoli that are small um, air sacs within the lungs. Then there are thousands and thousands of these, and each section, each group of alveoli is surrounded by blood capillaries. So we have very thin-walled um, alveoli and you have very thin walled capillaries so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily transfer from one to the other by diffusion through the cell membranes. The, the oxygen is going to be going from a high concentration in the air in the lungs to a lower concentration in the blood here and the same with the carbon dioxide. There's a higher concentration of carbon dioxide here than in the inspired or breathed in air and so carbon dioxide is going to move by diffusion from higher concentration in the blood to lower concentration in the alveolus and then you will blow out or ex exhale the air containing a higher percentage of carbon dioxide. Another system of nutrient absorption that's involved with both of these is the circulatory system. The circulatory system transports nutrients from the digestive and respiratory systems to cells throughout the body. Remember when we talked about circulatory systems in animals, there were, there were open circulatory systems and closed circulatory systems, and there were even animals that did not have a circulatory system but depended upon diffusion from cell to cell to take care of transporting the nutrients. In open circulatory systems, the blood is in sinuses or cavities rather than vessels within the animal and comes into direct contact with body cells. In closed circulatory systems, the blood remains in vessels and gas and nutrient exchange takes place through the vessel walls like we saw with the lung. Um, the um, circulatory systems we talked about in class when we talked about the different vertebrate groups involve single loop circulatory systems and double loop circulatory systems. And so this is a comparison of what happens here. In the fish, which have single loop systems, you have the heart that's pumped, uh, the heart that pumps the blood, it's a two chambered heart, pumps the blood, which goes to the gill capillaries where carbon dioxide is exchanged for oxygen. And then the blood is pumped to the rest of the body where the oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide. Then it goes back to the heart, pumps to the gills and so forth, just a single loop back and forth. In a double loop system with a three chambered heart, you have the pulmocutaneous circuits because these, or these animals like frogs can also exchange gas through their skin um, as well as through their, as through their um, lungs. And so the blood is pumped from the heart to this pulmocutaneous circuit where the gas exchange occurs. That blood goes back to the heart and is then a pump to the rest of the body. However, since there's only one ventricle, there is mixing of the oxygen-rich blood from the, from the lungs and the oxygen-poor blood from the body. And so the blood is not, not totally oxygenated that is, is pumped to the cells. There is some of the oxygen that's still present in the blood as it comes back to the heart. So that's a double loop, three chambered heart. And then when you get to the birds and mammals, you have a four chambered double loop system where there's total separation of the oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood. Notice how the heart 
is labeled. Okay, you're looking at the, it's on your left as you look at the picture, but this is the right side of the heart. When we look at diagrams like that, we're looking at diagram the heart as if it is in the, in the chest of the organism that you're looking at. So if you're looking at this lemur here, okay, this is its left side, and the, this is its right side as you're looking at it. The next system we have is reproductive system. In the reproductive system, this is the creation of new individuals from existing ones. There are two main kinds of reproduction. There's asexual reproduction, which is where you genetically identical offspring are produced from a single parent. This is really advantageous when you're trying to get a lot of offspring quickly. But the problem is it produces genetically uniform populations. And then you have sexual reproduction where you have the fusion of gametes from two separate parents producing a unique combination of genes. And this is important because it increases the genetic variability within populations. Human reproduction is regulated by hormone cycles. That is, that's part of the endocrine system. And it, these hormones are involved in the development and maturation of organs of reproduction, in the production of gametes through spermatogenesis and oogenesis, and the preparation of organs for fertilization and gestation. <clears throat> Here we see a couple of different things involved in the hormone regulation. Here we have how uh, the negative feedback system from the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain, to the pituitary, which is part of the endocrine system, to control the production, let's say, of sperm in the testis. Okay? When there's androgen, which is one of the male hormones is produced, then that's going to be a negative feedback to turn things off the turn off the production of more when you get the right when you get the right amount to the set point um, and to turn it off in the pituitary and in the hypothalamus and here we have the, ve the several different hormones that are involved in the female reproductive system and how they peak at different times um, because they have different functions and come from different organs and this concludes the set of notes be sure that you're completing the worksheets that are in your packet. There's one on the absorption of digested food, which we'll do in class, one on the respiratory system, one on the circulatory system that we will talk about in class.